Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for the, the presentation and for the fact that you introduced me. Uh, I am going today to speak about marriage and uh, I think uh, our meeting will be very useful and I also want to thank you for this invitation to speak to you. Uh, some years ago, I resigned uh, from my job as a teacher of foreign languages, and I did a reconversion uh, in uh, parenting. Uh, I had a purpose to help families thrive and honor God. Um, I want to continue to say se several things about me. Uh, so um, as a Christian uh, counselor, I dealt especially with uh, the relationship between husband and wife on a various issues such as conflicts, spouse neglect, parenting, relationship fidelity issues, or broken marriages. Uh, you can see my family, we've got two boys, one girl, and uh, we live in uh, Romania. Uh, today I'm uh, going to speak um, about uh, marriages, about couples. Uh, especially how to build strong Christian marriages. Um, and uh, one of uh, my aims is to uh, provide some practical and applicable uh, issues today, which are meant to enrich your family and couple life. So I want to be so pra as practical as possible. Um, in the last decades, social changes pressed uh, Christian families uh, with the social trends, and uh, there were some changes in uh, in family. Some were uh, uh, unfortunate, some were fortunate, but uh, uh, family uh, experienced major difficulties. Uh, one of the change which I see globally is that women become more educated, more autonomous, and more com competent, while men uh, became more confused about their role in the family. Uh, um, I read many books uh, on couples, marriage, and so on. And in the last years, I have seen that uh, there are uh, more books which uh, have a subject like this, the role of the man in the house. It is very uh, interesting that I didn't find a topic in those books about the role of the woman in the house. So I let you think about it and why I, I said that. Another change is that today we were educated to think more about uh, marital satisfaction. Uh, you know that in the past, uh, we discussed more about duty, uh, the duty a husband and a wife has. And uh, today, owing to science, owing to studies, owing to pressure from this field, we were taught to think in satisfaction terms. Yeah, and... Um, uh, men and women look for that. Uh, I want to say from the very beginning that the Bible also speaks about uh, the sanctity of marriage and uh, the duties associated with that. As a practitioner, I've worked uh, about two decades with children, couples, adults, and um, I want to say that um, in the light of the Bible, I've seen that there are three main reasons why Christian families fail to develop, to solve conflicts, and to live the life God intended to expose. Um, I wanna go to the first reason. I, I, I think you'll find it very interesting. The first reason is that Christian families fail to develop the conflicts and live the life God intended to expose because uh, we have, or they have, a weakened Christian belief system. It's about what we believe. Uh, uh, we often uh, uh, think uh, uh, in a particular way and have, uh, let's say, wrong beliefs about Christian marriage and life and God. I found in the Bible uh, two scriptures which you probably know very well, uh, Romans 12 with two. I wanna read it from the New Living Translation. I found some copies of the Bible which express it better. So uh, I quote, 
don't copy the behavior and customs of the world by uh, but let the god transform you into a new person by changing the way you think so it says by changing the way you think i want to read another proverb for uh, proverb uh, proverbs 4 with 23 from good news translation which says be careful how you think your life is shaped by your thoughts. Uh, it's so nicely said here about what we think. Uh, I tell my students, the most powerful force in our life as an individual, which you possess, is the way you think. It's yours, it's intimate, it's private. I might, I might, I might not know it, but it will definitely influence your life. Um, the point is that what you think is very likely to happen because you are what you think. Um, let's think a little bit together. If you think, I quote, when things work in my marriage, I will quit and find some, somebody else. As a Christian, you are in danger because you will be tempted to do so. We cannot accommodate in our mind this idea of separation, for example, and the idea of the sanctity of marriage. There are two ideas which cannot dwell together. I used to say that the headquarters of your life is what you think and what you believe, because they are very important things. So um, as a piece of advice, read the Bible and change the way you think. Actually, your life and my life uh, is shaped by uh, our thoughts. All our personality is shaped by, by um, our thoughts, uh, no matter uh, good or bad convictions we have. Uh, a wife in uh, her uh, 30s used to say, a client of mine, I don't uh, get along with my husband, but I chat on WhatsApp with my work colleague. So I share my emotions. We are just very good friends, she said. Well, definitely active relationships between a woman and a man outside the marriage are a sin and they damage your marriage relationship, right? Uh, one more argument is that all marriage and counselors uh, consider that such an emotional relationship um, will affect marriage and it is a kind of marriage infidelity. Uh, the, this of, uh, of uh, effective relationship is at least as serious as, as a physical infidelity, as physical infidelity. When you think it's okay, probably the chances to do that are higher when the opportunities arise. I want to give you a last example. Uh, this year, I worked with a Christian middle-aged couple, and I was doing online Christian counseling in English. They used to have permanent misunderstandings, uh, uh, power fights. Uh, she had doubts that she can be happy with her husband. Actually, what happened is that her thoughts and convictions shaped uh, her life. As a result, her strategies for coping with her problems was to quit, to complain, to look for happiness elsewhere. And she never tried to work on her relationship. For me, it's sad. She had, a, she had poor Christian convictions and she declared that she was less religious. I have an, an opposite example for his, uh, I want to give. Uh, the opposite example is a man of God who had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But he, wa he went to church, he read the Bible, but uh, he didn't receive much education at home. Uh, he didn't know how to behave with his, wi his wife and how to satisfy her emotionally and spiritually. Uh, he was even harsh with his wife, insensitive to her needs. Uh, uh, one day when he found that he has a problem, he did something. He tried to work uh, uh, and find solutions for, for that problem. Uh, he finally uh, started to understand that he has uh, to be emotional because she needs that. 
listen to her and uh, also develop emotional intimacy. Uh, so he didn't do any of these things in the past, but uh, because he was a very good Christian, he could uh, stick to the, the, the Bible and uh, find the best solutions because uh, um, a rule is that what we learn, uh, if, if there is something which is uh, learned and it is bad, we can relearn it. So my uh, dearest advice to you is no matter where you are or what you do, is this. If you are a Christian leader, uh, work to build in the minds of the believers in our church and deep and healthy biblical convictions about marriage. Explain, discuss, give examples, find solutions, work with a good Christian counselor. Uh, what you believe matters a lot. They prevent the good beliefs, good convictions prevent us from troubles and pain in the marriage. Uh, some, some might say, well, we worship God, we uh, pray, we uh, bow down before God. That's very good, that's Christian, that, that, that must be in the church. But uh, when, when we, we speak about marriages, uh, we should also keep in mind that convic convictions or beliefs, the beliefs we have shape our life, our personality our emotions, our attitudes, everything. So uh, as leaders, probably we should do that and care about what the believers in our church uh, believe concerning marriages, marriage. Simple member in the church, uh, trust God in the Bible. Probably there are more uh, and many alternative beliefs but I guess that trusting God in the Bible is a very good solution and it, it is the best. Let me tell you something very important. The biggest challenge if you have a marriage which doesn't work is not to give up and uh, separate, no. It's to work on that marriage, to work on the thing which doesn't work. Uh, and that is your marriage. The solution is not to give up in because give up or give in, uh, this, uh, these actions uh, definitely won't uh, restore marriage. Uh, let's go to the second point um, for tonight. So the second reason why Christian families fail to develop, solve conflicts, and live the life God intended to suppose is, is that husbands adopt authoritarian marriage roles and ignore, ignore the Christian love-based sacrificing role for their wives. Uh, Colossians 3 with 19 from uh, Weymouth New Testament says, married men, be affectionate to your wives and do not treat them harshly. Well, men sometimes behave harshly, right? And the Bible reminds us of the fact that uh, uh, this is true and uh, there is some danger lurking us. I looked into the Webster Dictionary. What is harsh? What means harsh? And I quote, it means to cause painful reactions, to be excessive, ex excessively critical or negative. So uh, another question, very, very interesting is, uh, why do I speak about, why, why am I speaking about men and not also about women at this point? Well, a good question indeed. I have to reason, the reason that, of course, uh, a woman can behave harshly towards a man, right? Everybody, that it's simple. Uh, it's not uh, very difficult, but it's bad. But uh, firstly, I speak about men because uh, the Bible admits that there is a higher risk for men to behave like that. And secondly, there is a worldwide tendency of men because they are males and they are masculine to behave with harshness. They are physically more powerful, for example, and they like to gain control, to be in control. Um, I want to say that all forms of control and, and, uh, and uh, aggressions are bad. All forms of, of control which uh, rely on force. 
And no matter who does them, they are always wrong. Unfortunately, I must confess that, that uh, most, most complaints of women are like this. So women complain mostly uh, about such uh, issues. He's not romantic or he puts too much, too much pressure on me or I feel like living in a cage in this marriage. So I've, I've heard all these uh, sentences said by women in uh, the last years. Um, a man or a woman, if you want, generally can control in two ways. Firstly, we have behavioral control, such as questioning intensively, yeah? Prescribing behaviors, we say how things should be done, restricting behaviors, taking control over the partner actions and so on. Secondly, another form of control, it's called psychological control. Uh, we try to control the mind, the, the thoughts and the feelings. And uh, uh, we as men sometimes uh, find in the position in which we control her thoughts because we don't like how she thinks. Uh, I give you some, some examples here of uh, psychological control. We might have a harsh tone. We uh, might uh, verbally punish uh, the way she thinks. Uh, we might uh, make her guilty because we think uh, she is wrong and we must correct her and impose our point of view. Uh, we, must, uh, we might disagree with uh, each other and uh, uh, we might disagree, for example, with uh, her personal needs and complaints, complaints uh, for example. Uh, so all these behaviors are wrong because they use force and uh, force is not uh, a helper in marriage. Uh, harshness hurts, unpleasant. Uh, one more statement to make here. Uh, control is not bad. Act actually, instead, instead of being harsh, you might exert healthy control by doing what the Bible says. Be affectionate. You, if, if we like control, being affectionate to our wives is the best way to control things, if you want to say. Uh, it's, it, it's something which the Bible says, and it's something which is very uh, pleasant. Um, but we shouldn't try to treat harshly because um, uh, that is, is not something to help us in our marriage. Uh, I remember that uh, a man entered my office one day and he said, I just tell her the truth. She just cannot stand it. I keep showing her where she is wrong. I keep explaining her all the time, but she feels offended. Well, of course she feels offended. Uh, this is a sort of psychological control when you make uh, people uh, feeling guilty, aren't they uh, right to uh, feel offended? Of course. Uh, so this is a form of uh, unhealthy control. Permanently reminding her about her faults does not teach her how to approach the problem. And uh, instead, we should show affectionate, affectionate, uh, an affectionate attitude and support her and be close to her. That's the best thing uh, to do. Uh, the hardest part of my work with couples is to convince men and sometimes women that being critical, controlling, blaming, or exerting power never works. It's so hard because we think that will work, but it won't work. Uh, sometimes I hear spouses saying, but I'm not harsh at all. I never do that. Well, uh, sometimes we have a perfect opinion about ourselves, which is good, but uh, do you know how we can check that? Let's ask our wives, because probably they'll say, yeah, you're right. You are not harsh. You are very uh, compassionate and uh, friendly. But sometimes they can say, well, you're not that way. Um, I had a couple in counseling uh, some time ago and uh, they had permanent fights and serious misunderstandings and suffering because of money. Uh, she had more money than him and uh, he felt miserable. 
and he was trying permanently to sabotage her. Instead of fighting, I inviting them to discuss together about the topic, but they couldn't. Uh, they had a power fight for about uh, an hour. Uh, and when they finished, I asked them. Now, uh, I'd like each of you to tell the other one what you actually want, calmly and confidently. I would like the other person to write on a sheet of paper and explain later what they what he or she understood. Fortunately, they had their first real conversation in near eight years, calmly and compassionately. She, try, she uh, ended the, the session by smiling on the subject because they agreed and, uh, uh, how, on how to manage money. And uh, um, at the end of the session, they stopped fighting. The solution is not uh, to, to be harsh. The solution is to express our needs assertively and calmly and compassionately. Uh, I have a, a favorable proverb, which says, in Proverbs 15 with 4, it says like this, I quote, gentle words bring life and health. Gentle words bring life and health. So nicely expressed. I have some uh, pieces of, of advice for you. This is uh, uh, my dearest. All in all, if, you, have, if you, you are a mother and you have boys, please teach them and shape their behavior to be affectionate to their sisters and women in the family. Uh, if you wanna see them uh, uh, one day be affectionate towards their wives and uh, husbands, uh, wives and uh, ch children, Teach them now to be affectionate. Teach boys to be affectionate because uh, uh, they need that. Uh, this is how gentle words will bring life and health to their wife and family. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it's very important to tell you again, men are at a higher risk than girls not to learn the, emotion, the, the emotional language. And the risk to develop towards a more toxic masculinity characterized by power, aggression, and dominance. So this is an inclination for men. So my advice is to help boys bring life and health, as Proverbs 15 says, to their own family. Educate boys when they are children, because it's easier for, her, for, for them to learn the emotional language and express it later. Uh, this is another subject we don't have uh, time today to discuss on it, but uh, definitely it's a, a key and very important subject for, uh, of parenting. Uh, if you are a, a husband, keep in mind that harshness has never solved the problem. Instead, be calm and conversationally. Let's go to the third uh, issue in our list today. Um, the third reason why uh, I think uh, our marriages don't work or um, uh, the third reason uh, which um, uh, could contribute to a better marriage is this. Uh, fam families fail to develop, solve conflicts and live the life God intended to spouses because spouses demand egocentric need fulfillment and do not, do not focus on altruistic need fulfill fulfillment. Egocentric means to ask, to think about yourself. Altruistic means to offer. So there is a, a big difference between the two. I want to again uh, read uh, two scriptures from the Bible, which you know very, very well, but I read them from another uh, version of the Bible, from Amplified Version, Ephesians 5, uh, from 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives, seek the highest good for her, and surround her with a caring, unselfish love. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself, uh, himself up for her. Now for wives. Wives, be subject to your uh, own husband as a service to the Lord. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also, also wives should be subject to their husbands in everything respecting both their position as protector and their responsibility to God 
as head of the house. Um, it's very interesting that most men today complain that wives don't respect them. And most women complain that men don't love them enough and are not affectionate. These are the most uh, frequent complaints I see uh, on a daily basis uh, in, in couples. Uh, the easiest way in marriage is to care only for yourself, right? care only for myself without paying attention to the other person and uh, um, our, my partner's needs. But, but that doesn't help my marriage. It's the easy, easy, but it's not the right way. There is a classical scenario, uh, which I wanna uh, say. The classical scenario, which I see today is that couples come to uh, and uh, seek help because they cannot reach uh, an agreement with each other. The, life, uh, the wife complains that uh, he doesn't help with the uh, chores, with, uh, children's homework, gets angry, and then he retreats. Uh, uh, she also keeps on complaining uh, on, uh, about the fact that uh, he cannot listen uh, without giving advice or uh, without seeking solutions. Now it's his turn. Why? What uh, do men do when they complain? They complain about the fact that uh, um, uh, she is using an accusing tone for people, and uh, she doesn't approve him. Uh, she becomes nervous, or she recalls all the mistakes since the day of the wedding of their wedding. Uh, the point is this, if we analyze what they say, they are both right. She has her truth and he has his truth. But uh, the most important truth is that their relationship doesn't work. And it doesn't work because they both are defensive, egocentric uh, regarding their needs. They both demand, but nobody does uh, absolutely nothing for the other person. So this is a difference between being altruistic and uh, being, being egocentric. Um, probably, uh, definitely, we must be altruistic. Let's uh, speak a little bit about uh, the needs of the men, and then we'll speak about uh, the needs of the women. Um, please uh, listen very carefully what I'm going to say. God created us, men and women, with the same needs but the needs have a different priority. Ephesians 5 says that husbands are seeking to be in position. They like that. They like to be the protector. They like to be the head of the family. Uh, men like to be in charge. They often do that. They like to get involved. They like to get uh, to find solutions. And uh, uh, this is very nice. Men like to be the hero for her to be the one who does things and is appreciated. His performance is, is, is appreciated. Uh, he is most uh, pleased when he feels competent and useful, and he is appreciated for his performance. I wanna say that both men and women like to feel competent. Of course, um, we all like that, but uh, men definitely, uh, define themselves by the fact that their uh, need of appreciation probably is uh, higher. Uh, let's come back to the Bible. Her duty is to keep in mind that she needs to appreciate him and respect his position. When it's hard for uh, her, she should remember that she's doing that firstly as a service to the Lord. Um, Unfortunately, uh, uh, we must admit that as husbands today, we feel sometimes that we've lost our power and we lose it more and more. And we sometimes feel uh, useless regarding our duty in, in, in our family. Uh, let me uh, tell you a secret. I often, I often tell that uh, to my students. Uh, wives often complain that husbands don't get involved sufficiently. For example, in growing children or in uh, home chores. And too often when uh, our wives notice that, they put pressure. 
on uh, their husband and demand in a higher tone. Then men step back and don't get involved at all. And then she puts again pressure on him. Men again retreats and do, uh, do nothing. You see, there is something uh, which uh, repeats here. Uh, the more you put pressure, the more uh, he feels uh, insecure and the less competent and uh, the more he retreats and does nothing. As I explain my, uh, uh, my students, if you want to um, uh, have a husband who gets more involved in home chores, for example, or in uh, bringing children, respect them. Make them feel competent and useful. Um, man's involvement in home chores and in bringing up children depends on wives' encouragement and respect. It sounds a very radical statement, but studies show that men uh, will involve in bringing up children and in chores as long as his wife encourage, encourages him to do that because uh, in most situations, it seems that she feels more powerful to do this. And women are more prepared probably as, uh, or they think they are more prepared to grow up children and uh, men will help as long as uh, they are encouraged. Well, that's how men are. When men feel respected, they'll get involved more often. When men feel useful, they'll help and do the hard work. Um, that's why the Bible advises women never to lose sight of the fact that men must be respected and women must be subject to husbands as to the Lord. This is, uh, this is man's need. This is how God created us. Uh, one more piece of advice and then we'll go to uh, women, uh, to wives. Uh, in my culture, and I think it might be universally true, wives expect men to get the idea without words. Men, uh, they say, women say, should read between lines and uh, be responsible and mature. Husbands must see her needs and do something about it immediately. Well, some husbands may do that, of course. And this is the best practice for men. Yeah, we must admit that that's true. But for uh, some of us, it is necessary to speak and to ask politely or even to say a few times until it's done. Why is that? Because uh, men perceive it as a form of attention sometimes. Uh, and um, uh, sometimes women think that it's not proper to ask a man to do something because in the uh, women in, in, in the, uh, their world, uh, they uh, read between lines uh, and uh, they uh, sometimes don't prefer the straight language. Uh, uh, please listen uh, uh, carefully. Husbands used to say, but you didn't tell me. You didn't tell me. That's what we say because uh, uh, we like to be said uh, straight. So don't assume that it's totally wrong to tell a man straight what you want as a wife. I often uh, speak to my students and we debate that and speak about that. And they all, all women tell me, yeah, we expect them to read between lines. But uh, he never does that or uh, he doesn't do that too often. And then I say, well, what's the option? The option is to tell him straight what he uh, must uh, do because we uh, uh, actually um, don't assume that he knows. Uh, it might be true. A straight and assertive language is very often very efficient and useful if, uh, and, and the husbands uh, don't feel offended generally. Uh, Ephesians 4 with 5 uh, says, speak the truth in love. Uh, and probably that would be the right thing uh, to do, to communicate straightly, because uh, otherwise we might not understand what is to be done. Let's go to women, because uh, this is a very interesting subject. What, uh, what are the needs of women? Uh, the Bible speaks very nicely about how husbands should treat their wives. Very nicely. 
I love this passage very much. Uh, it's in Ephesians 5 from 25 to 27. I'll read from Amplified Version. It says, uh, husbands, love your wife, seek the highest good for her and surround her with a caring, unselfish love. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself, himself up for her. Um, I want to tell you something very, very important. It's very personal. I work with couples for some years now. One of the biggest discoveries about women as a man is that they get tired and they even block emotionally, totally or partially. I haven't read this idea in a book. I discovered it by doing practice. I see the, the case uh, most often in my office. I haven't seen that happening too often in men. Women seem to be more sensitive, sensitive to emotional needs. And when they don't feel loved for a longer period of time, they suffer and get tired uh, and they get stuck emotionally, partially or totally. Uh, I don't know, I have a statistics here. It says that up to 80% of the today's divorces are initiated by women. This informs us of the fact that they get tired emotionally because they look for uh, emotional satisfaction in marriage. I want to define what means to get tired in case of woman. Uh, means that she does not feel loved emotionally uh, for a longer period of time. And uh, when it happens, she makes sacrifices. She, do she does her best to get emotional intimacy but she doesn't succeed. Price. Uh, metaphorically speaking, she closes doors one by one in her life. Uh, let me give you several examples. She, she stops to share her thoughts with her husband. That would be a door closed. That's not good. That's bad. But when it happens, she closes doors because she's disappointed and she wasn't loved for a longer period of time. She stops to ask him to do things for her, but she does them all by herself and becomes physically and mentally tired. Well, uh, that's again uh, uh, something uh, which is not very good um, for uh, her emotional uh, uh, life. Um, at a certain point, she might understand that her husband can be emotional. She needs emotions. Uh, her brain uh, absorbs emotions. She lives in an emotional world. And uh, she decides to live her life with minimum affection. That's uh, again a side effect, an effect of the fact that she is not loved, she be loved. So uh, this, is a, uh, this is a very often a very serious problem, which must be solved immediately. Uh, she, must, she becomes vulnerable and unhappy. Even if she performs in family, she does her duty. Uh, the scripture I read uses the superlative to describe what husbands must do. The, the, uh, pay attention a little bit. The, the Bible doesn't say man's primary, primary care should be to ac accumulate possessions or to be controlling, which is easier for, uh, for us, right? Uh, it says to be emotional, right? So hard to do that. I read again from the Bible. The Bible says, love. It doesn't say anything else. It says, love. Seek the highest good for her. Not some good. It says, seek the highest good for her. The superlative again. And I like the last part in the amplified version. It says like this. Surround her with a caring, unselfish love. Well, I try to imagine because the, this is something visual. Surround her. What means to surround a woman with a caring, unselfish love? I imagine that uh, to surround her with love means not to give her a chance to feel unloved. Do you agree? To surround a woman with uh, a caring, unselfish love probably means not to give her a chance to feel unloved because that's her vulnerability. 
this is how women are. Uh, uh, there is a risk if we don't do that sufficiently. Wives I see on a daily basis in my uh, practice might close doors one by one in silence. Um, and uh, it's so sad that sometimes we don't pay attention enough and uh, uh, we think that's uh, a second need and we uh, avoid or forget or we are not sufficiently attentive to meet her emotional needs. Um, I remember uh, I often ask uh, couples in my private counseling discussions, I ask him, uh, them, men, actually I ask men, how did you conquer your wife? What did you do uh, that she liked you? Do you remember? A father told me he was married, uh, had children. He told me when I asked him uh, this, I don't remember how he impressed my other wife. I said, what? Don't you remember what you did 15 years ago? Really? No. And we discussed about it. And uh, he finally <laughs> remembers several things. I said, um, um, you need to do that daily, not uh, once when we, you meet her. We need to surround her with the caring and selfish love, but how often? That's the tough question, yeah? Because, uh, uh, so they need uh, daily, every day. Uh, we, we think that uh, women, our, life, our wives uh, need to be paid attention daily because they are emotional and they need that. Um, if you are in such a situation uh, and you probably must relearn, learn again, how to surround your wife with a caring and selfish love. It's not simple, I tell you, it's not very simple. If you haven't learned at the right time, now might be uh, more difficult, but it's not uh, the end. No, uh, definitely you can learn to surround her with love, but uh, you, you must, work, you must uh, 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 do something about it. Um, let me tell you another thing, which is very interesting. I often give people books to read. And I tell, please, I tell them, please read that book because it's very interesting. And when people uh, don't know about how serious, uh, how bad is their, their relationship, they say, well, I'm not interesting, uh, is very interested in that book. Well, I read some of uh, the book. Well, um, the book didn't help me very much. And when they dig deeper and see how serious is their problem, they do the opposite. They buy books, they read books, they are interested in books. And they ask, well, recommend me another book because I want to understand my wife. Uh, so I want to dwell uh, on another uh, issue right now very shortly. How can you respond to her emotional needs? Well, uh, we've already said that the needs of men and wives uh, and women uh, are universal. They are expressed differently in different cultures, but the priorities are different. Her needs are multiple and uh, probably the most important need she has is to uh, be to receive uh, love and uh, to have an emotional husband who understands her and who secures her. Uh, that's why the Bible tells us in the first place to love our wives, because that's the most important thing to do. And this should be our first concern, not the last, not the second, the first concern. Uh, if you want to express your uh, love uh, toward the, towards your wife, I want to finish this presentation with uh, several pieces of advice and uh, tell you the first, uh, actively listen to your wife, to listen actively means to uh, understand what she says without uh, providing solutions or uh, without trying to help her. Wives often find their own solutions once they finish saying what they want to say. They want to just be secured. They want to just uh, be understood. It's very important to listen to what she want to say. Uh, the second piece of advice, in short, because we don't have time today to discuss very, very much on the topic, is that all humans need a certain degree of autonomy and independence. But uh, this is expressed differently in different cultures. So give her room and time 
for her personal needs. As the man, you and me, we all have personal needs, right? Women have, our wives have their personal needs. So pay attention to that because uh, sometimes she want to do several things without us. So it's okay. That means to have their own autonomy and independence. Uh, the third piece of advice is uh, don't be harsh to her. already said about it. Harshness damages relationships uh, and uh, women and men are affected. I won't dwell um, longer uh, on, on this one. Uh, the last piece of advice is this, and it's very important. Uh, try to know her and develop emotional intimacy. Emotional intimacy means to express emotions and uh, feel, feel emotionally good. Uh, it means to be spiritual, if you want, and combine uh, uh, spiritual uh, intimacy and emotional intimacy. If you buy fancy stuff in order to solve marriage problems and spend much money, and uh, probably you might go on vacations because we like vacations, uh, men like vacations. Be sure that your wife wants that. If, it, uh, if uh, she might... Uh, want you to speak to her instead, uh, to reassure her, to understand her, or to help her in the kitchen. She might want small things from you, not big things. Um, but they uh, matter uh, a, lo a lot. I want to end by saying that love is a perception. So uh, that means that we have uh, different love languages. And that's why we must communicate. We must uh, uh, understand what the other person says. We must speak. And uh, uh, if that, uh, if you want to do the right uh, thing. Well, uh, this was my presentation for today. Probably we, I could uh, have said much more, but the time is short. Thank you for, uh, for listening to me and the thoughts I expressed. And I think and hope that you found them uh, useful for you and your family. And uh, I hope things will improve if necessary. Thank you. Marius, I think you will need to stop sharing your screen, please. Yes, I'll try right now. Um, thank you. Um, we are going now to go into a um, time of uh, discussion, uh, particularly with our um, panelists. Um, and uh, our panelists were introduced to us. Um, they are Damaris Playa from Spain, um, Patrizio and Jennifer Zucchetto from Italy, uh, Miroslav Chismanski from Serbia, uh, and uh, uh, Peter Kozar from Slovakia. And I invite them to. Um, uh, make themselves visible, um, and uh, I need to go to gallery so I can see them all. Um, <clears throat> so thank you very much, Marius, for that uh, um, uh, presentation. Um, and um, I am. Uh, can I remind you that in the audience that you must, uh, if you want to make questions pose questions that you need to do so through the chat function, which is on the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom dialog box where it says chat and uh, not the Q&A, which is uh, if you want to, uh, sorry, you, you need to pose questions in Q&A, which is to the left-hand side of the uh, chat um, uh, symbol. So in the Q&A, uh, click on that and you can uh, post questions. And I have someone who is helping me, Duarte Casmarinho from Portugal, 
who uh, will be selecting questions and uh, uh, feeding them to me. Uh, please understand that it may not be possible to deal with every question uh, that is posed. And if your question is not selected, please don't uh, be uh, offended uh, by that. So um, I think we are uh, waiting uh, for uh, some questions. Um, and while we're waiting, perhaps I could invite one or two members of the panel to, um, if, uh, if there are particular things about what uh, uh, Marius says, said, uh, which you'd like to um, comment on or underline. So could I ask Damaris if she might like to uh, comment first of all, uh, putting her on the spot, I'm uh, uh, allowing a little time um, mm. to allow her to think for a moment before I uh, uh, hand the question to her. So Damaris, is there, uh, are there particular things you'd like to comment on from the presentation? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the for the presentation. It was a uh, little time, a lot of information, and, and I think that was really, really useful. Um, I think one of one of the, the main uh, ideas that we need to keep in mind is that uh, marriage is, is a compromise. It's not something that just happens in our life. It's not just to live comfortable with another person by my side. So I'm happy because I know he loves me and I know I love him. It's something that we need to work on every day. And at the end of the presentation, the speaker said, yes, yes, you have to do it every day. You have to work on that every day. I think that's one of the, one of the, the ideas that we need to keep in our minds. And this compromise, um, faces different challenges in different moments of our lives. So I think it's uh, one of the most important things that we need to remember is how to communicate to each other. So um, I really enjoyed very much when you talk about how men and women are and how different we express our feelings and our thoughts. So thank you so much. But for me, the, 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 the big idea is that this is a compromise and I need to work on this compromise. And my husband needs to work as well on this compromise. So thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, thank you, um, Damaris. Patricio uh, and uh, Jennifer might like to uh, make some kind of comment uh, uh, before we uh, uh, proceed further. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to share. And um, yeah, thank you very much, brother, for all the hard work. And this is a huge subject, uh, a very important subject. And uh, I think as our sister from Spain is saying, I think it's not just something you think about it and you work on once a day, once a year, but it's an ongoing process. We usually have a lot, our family illustration and marriage is like a garden or like a plant. You need to take care, uh, you need to water, you need to take the, the weeds away, you need to work every day. And uh, in Italy, we have a, a phrase that prevention is better than cure. In other words, uh, even in our pastoral work, sometimes we have couples, we have uh, individuals who run to, to the, the, the emergency room because they've got problems. But I think we should... Uh, put in practice on a church level. And that's that's why I think those points that brother um, Marius was uh, pointing are important that we should, uh, on a pastoral level, we should uh, constantly um, put in practice in our church life, in our pastoral care, um, uh, safeguards in, or um, uh, helps for the couples, for, for the families. For example, one thing we, try to put in practice the actual accountability. Even if things are going well and there are no huge you know, alarms, that the, each couple should have a countable uh, relation with another mature couple. Um, just to have a checklist every so often over a meal, over a meeting, uh, to make sure that things are, are working well. So uh, thank you uh, very much. What do you say, Jennifer? 
Yes, I love the idea um, of always reminding um, each other that um, we have roles and it's a partnership. And um, for us as women, it's so important to embrace our womanhood and who we are in Christ. And that is something that I have, um, I learn every day and I enjoy learning new things from the Lord. And um, I think that was something that came through as well, just that we understood who we are in Christ and how we can complement each other um, and also accepting who our husband is and um, who we're serving together, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. Um, um, there is a question that uh, it has been posed, and uh, I think that... Um, it won't be just a question of uh, Marius uh, answering this, uh, but others may want to uh, um, intervene. Um, and the question is, does headship in marriage mean taking responsibility for the success of the marriage? Uh, does headship in marriage mean taking responsibility for the success uh, of the marriage? Marius, would you like to um, uh, comment on that? Yes, uh, so the question is, the, does headship in marriage, uh, meaning taking responsibility for the success uh, of the marriage? Mm. Uh, so if I understand well the question, if it uh, deals with the fact that uh, the man should uh, be the head in the family, and that means that uh, head, headship means uh, taking responsibility, and that will lead to success. Well, you see roles today change very much, but, but from a, a Christian perspective, that would be true. Uh, men like to the power, like to lead, but uh, it, they should lead in the family in the right way, loving. So I, I talk about, with my students and I ask them, can you give me an example of uh, right control, control which is healthy? And they couldn't. I say, but love, what is love? When you love somebody, do you control that person? Yes. But, but that's love, it's something else. So uh, it matters a lot because uh, uh, women uh, like to be led by, by, uh, by their husband. Uh, success in marriage. I think this is one, one issue. Um, uh, the fact that the man leads in, in, in the marriage doesn't mean that the marriage will be successful automatically. I think there are more things to do. But uh, this is a, a, a headship, as it says the, que the question. It's a, a matter of positioning, but it, it matters a lot the content, what they do, the interaction, the intimacy, what they do together. Because you know, love means it's an emotion, it's a, a behavior, but intimacy is something you create together. And that, there are more types of intimacy. For example, spiritual or affective or uh, uh, intimacy which is psychological. Uh, these matter a lot more than, uh, I, I tell my students, more than love sometimes, because it's what you do together. It's not just that uh, I love you from the very beginning. No, it's, it's about doing things uh, on a regular basis together. And that means intimacy, it means emotions, it means listening, it means caring, it means being, being attentive. So it's much more than than uh, being the head of the family. It's true that in our uh, Christian tradition, we believe that men should lead, and that's very good. Uh, but I would add that uh, if we link success to headship, there should be something more. Uh, thank you. Uh, is, uh, would anybody like to comment on that from the, uh, the other members of the panel? Uh, Miro. Yeah, I remember uh, what my father used to tell me. He was married for, for 50 years and they had a great marriage. Uh, he told me that uh, women will never have a problem to submit to a husband who loves her. So right. if a man is loving and showing compassion uh, and understanding and uh, being gentle, the women will never have problem to, su to submit uh, to his authority as a, as a leader, as a head of the family. Could I uh, press you on a, a, another point, Marius? Um, you, you almost said, I think, or suggested that um, 
uh, that, that women should, in a sense, have mercy on men and be less oblique, uh, less uh, um, uh, indirect in um, uh, expressing themselves. Um, uh, I, I speak with, for somebody with 56 years uh, of, of marriage, uh, and um, it's quite true. I often do say to my, my wife, e even now, well, if you wanted me to do that, why didn't you say so? Why didn't you make it clear? But the, the truth of the matter is, isn't it, that we, we as uh, certainly uh, as males need to, um, you know, get real and stop, stop uh, worrying uh, or stop uh, demanding clarity when we know we won't get it, uh, or at least it's not the natural thing. Uh, and um, uh, therefore, you know, we, we have to be intelligent and, and on the lookout. And that this is, uh, that, that uh, you know, when, when my, this is an old example, I remember it being given a long time ago, you know, a, a wife doesn't say, uh, would you go and fill a coal scuttle? Um, when you have to go out over the veranda into the snow to, to collect the coal, uh, she says, oh, the coal scuttle's empty. Um, and uh, uh, you, you just have to. Now, are you uh, asking too much, as it were, of women to, be, uh, to, to, to uh, speak in plain language rather than code? Well, I agree with Damaris. Uh, she was right. Uh, marriage is a compromise, and I think... Uh, Yes, uh, we should meet somewhere in the middle. Uh, it's not for it's not bad for us uh, if she asks us directly and says, "Bill, I wanted to take the garbage and take it out or whatever." It's okay. Then we feel good that sometimes. But for her, that's something amazing. How comes that he doesn't get the idea? I mean, there is garbage. There is the the trash outside. He should pick it and. To go outside and do it by yourself but he he doesn't think uh, about it so for a woman that's something amazing she vacuums in the living she does it by herself she expects the husband to get the idea but he doesn't get the idea he thinks she wants to do the vacuuming in the, the living so uh, we are very different uh, but uh, definitely uh, assertive language is hard we like as men we like sometimes uh, to be uh, to to speak directly but i think the uh, because we are different we cannot speak different languages and uh, understand each other we must uh, know the other's language i must uh, ask questions for example and uh, try to understand her if i don't understand yeah and uh, she might learn to ask uh, good questions about us because that's how we understand each other the most uh, difficult things which happens in life, uh, in my opinion, which I see, is that she feels unloved for years and she doesn't say. And men don't know that. Men say, well, you didn't tell me. When did I do that? I didn't do that. I don't remember. And I, I ask women, how long have you been uh, in such a state, uh, unloved? And she says, eight years. And, and why didn't, didn't you tell him? Well, I expected him to understand by himself. I don't uh, need to tell him. There is a saying which says, if I ask it, I don't want it anymore, any longer. So if I ask something, I don't want it any longer. So sometimes we, 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 we proceed uh, that way. And uh, that's why uh, I agree with Damaris that life is a compromise and marriage is a compromise and we need to find the proper language and the common language to understand each other. Um, a very specific question, which is about interpretation of uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 22, wives, submit yourself to your husbands uh, uh, as you do to the Lord. And the, the question is simply, um, or the request, is please explain. Um, I don't know, Peter Kozar, would you like to, uh, uh, how, how have you interpreted that in your, your experience of marriage? Well, thank you for asking a difficult question. <laughs> I believe that we are in a somewhat different position now 
in our world from uh, what it is to be when Paul wrote those words. As we are reading the words in the context, there is something required of women, there is something required of men, and it's all written in some culture. Now, when Paul wrote those things, it was, it was understood that women should submit to their husbands, or even they would say they should obey their husbands. That was something that was not surprising when, when Paul wrote that to Ephesians. What was surprising was the other part when he said, men, love your women sacrificially. So we really need to understand these both things together. And I agree with what Miro said, quoting his father, that it's easy for a woman to submit to men when she knows that she's loved sacrificially. Practically, I believe that we should try to find a common solution, whatever there is the problem that we are trying to solve. Uh, the man has his take on that issue and the woman has, its, uh, has her own and both parts should be heard, all things considered. And as much as possible, men and women should try to find uh, their common ground. What how they can agree to do, do things in the best way for both of them. Now, sometimes it might happen, it might be the case that they still believe that things should be done in different way. And uh, then after some effort that was invested in solving the issue, I, I think that uh, that's the time when, uh, when these words come uh, into play in the most, in the straightforward, straightforward way, then uh, the woman should submit to, their, to her husband, but not before she was heard and her point of view considered and with real effort given into finding a common solution. That's what I think would work in most cases, I believe. But, it, but really it has to happen in that context when she understands that she's loved, she has been heard, and her point of view taken into account. Damaris, do you have a perspective on this verse? Uh, well, let me tell you that um, when I read uh, this text when I was younger, I thought it was a very difficult text for me. I, 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 I thought it, it maybe here Paul wasn't uh, he didn't make things well uh, that, that was that was it but uh, as you grow and 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 you get married and you are in a relationship let me tell you what I have learned from this text what I have learned is that many many times we concentrate on the first part wives submit yourselves to your own husbands yes and we forget the second part as you do to the Lord I mean we, we submit to the Lord because we love him, but we know we, know we are loved in, a, in an incredible way by our Lord. So what I try to do, what I understand that I have to do is to move these feelings in and have a, a, a similar relation with my husband. I know he loves me to the end. I know he cares about me. And even if in a marriage, uh, there's a problem of communication, I, I need to remember that he loves me to the end and that he chose me and I chose him to be together. So for me, this, this, um, this text teaches me how to, how to build a healthy relationship with my husband. Not, it's not, um, it's not a, a, a fight. It's not to decide who is in control all the time. This is not the point. The point is that he loves me in an incredible, in a, in an, an in a great way, in an imagine, a, a, an incredible way. So I respond to that, assuming that 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 I I I, I want to submit myself to him. So I, I think it's something that. We can learn to do. I think we can learn to do. But we, again, we need to, to listen to each other and to see how, and to observe and to listen to each other, to, to see how he loves me, how I feel when he does this 
this action or that action. So it's a it's a process. It's a, a process. Yes. Thank you, Damaris. There is a question from from Kenya, which and this question which uh, shows, I think, how um, the shows the the variation in cultural backgrounds which we um, we face when we talk about marriage. Uh, I'll read the question as it is put here. A young man shares his intention to get married. He is very particular that he has no plans to do this formally through a church wedding. What key areas do I need to share with him? Uh, in one sense, I suppose, as far as Europe is concerned, um, it is quite, uh, we, we are we're evolving towards a situation a little bit like this in that um, it is possible, and many, many people do marry uh, in, in Europe um, through a, a civil wedding. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so there is no necessity on Christians, in fact, to have, um, uh, a marriage within the fellowship uh, of which they may be members of. Um, Marius, do you have any comment on uh, what you think? I, I think the implication of the question is that it would be good if the couple did uh, marry within uh, the, the Christian fellowship. Uh, what what advice would you give to the, to somebody advising him? So the the question doesn't say anything about uh, the fact that uh, whether they are Christians or not. Uh, well, doesn't... I, I think the implication uh, is that uh, that the, this young man is a Christian. Yes. Okay. Mm. Okay. So if they are Christian, uh, my my next question is, uh, how do they? Uh, what do they want to do? They want to live how? That's why I, I would like to, to find out if uh, from studies, I know that uh, the the, mo the most lasting uh, relationship is marriage. Uh, if they live together without a marriage uh, on a mean globally, it lasts between three and six years. Uh, of course, that's the pure statistics, but uh, that says that uh, God intended us to live in a marriage with one partner and that lasts uh, longer because I have another reason for that. The theory of love says that uh, there are three elements of love, intimacy, pa passion, which is sexual, and commitment. Commitment means a lot. It means that uh, I foresee that I can uh, be happy with that person because uh, it, it's a very nice thing. Because when we meet uh, uh, and we don't, uh, we don't really know each other, but we foresee, we, we see that in the future, we'll be happy one with each other. It's a promise. It's something we assume that will happen. And that's commitment. We commit one to each other. And uh, as Christians, as, as uh, followers of Jesus Christ, we want to have a life, uh, a Christian life together. Yeah. Miro, do you have a comment? Uh, I'm going to come to Patricia and Jennifer with the next question, if I may say. So, Miro, do you have a, um, a comment on this point? Well, uh, the marriage is very important and it should be public event. So, when to get together uh, with the decision to commitment to each other, that should be uh, very obvious, not uh, kind of a hidden thing. So. I know in the Bible, the marriage is a very public event and that was celebrated for a whole week. So uh, one, one thing that uh, I wanted to uh, uh, point that uh, what I like in the presentation is about uh, being selfish. And uh, that's the thing that uh, today is so obvious uh, in 2 Timothy 3 that says for people will be lovers of self or narcissistic self-focused. So in a marriage, that is a killer. If a husband and wife are selfish, that will kill uh, it, uh, the, the marriage, uh, the wedding and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wanted to encourage those couple to not think about uh, mm -hmm. themselves so much, but uh, marriage is a picture, a higher picture of uh, Jesus and uh, his church. So uh, when we commit to 
each other publicly in the church in a, be, between many witnesses. That is a great uh, example, great uh, testimony to whole uh, society, to the church uh, about wonderful thing that men and uh, women are going together. They, they are connected in the love, in the uh, wedding, in the marriage that the God wants to be in. Thank, thank you. Um, Praticia and uh, Jennifer, the question is, uh, is Christian marriage different from secular marriage in terms of the responsibilities of spouses? Uh, is Christian marriage different from secular marriage in terms of the responsibilities of spouses? Would you like to comment on that? This is a very good question. Um... Well, I think uh, marriage is uh, above every culture and uh, we find from the Lord, from the first pages of the Bible, that uh, marriage is not a social idea, it's not a secular idea or as a Christian or religious idea. I think it's one idea, one plan, one purpose, and it comes from uh, the Lord. The Lord is uh, the creator uh, of marriage. And I think in the in the passages that have been already quoted, there is a strong parallelism where Christ and the church, husband and wife. So I think the rules are the same. Of course, when we um, read the Bible, when we ask the Lord, we have a clear idea what marriage is all about. We live in a very selfish, as I've already been said, very selfish and individualistic society. Individualism, especially in the last three, four decades, has uh, uh, created a lot of problems in marriages, in churches, but uh, um, where people go into marriage where has the idea of self-fulfillment. There is a, a, a very uh, good book that um, has a, a very good uh, uh, quote where it says, uh, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? People, uh, without Christ in their mind, the, without any uh, Christian commitment, they usually they may enter in marriage with the idea of about me. It's about me. It's my, my own purposes, my own expectations. It's all about me and filling myself. But actually, the Lord has a, a precise um, purpose uh, for marriage. Would you like to add something, Jennifer? Yes, I think the idea that if um, you're Christian and you're married, it's you're given that example to the world of what a biblical um, marriage would be, a godly marriage would be. And that's a sacrifice and um, a service in itself, because you're demonstrating um, what the Lord has done in your life and how you're sacrificing um, your ego, your ego of as what Patrizio said about being happy in your marriage, but actually self-sacrificing to demonstrate how much you love your your Lord Jesus Christ, how you love your husband and your family, and I think that's one of the biggest testimonies and um, services we can all do to the country, our village, or town where we live in. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that would be the difference. Yeah. Any other uh, comment on that question um, from uh, others, uh, whether Marius or, or others on the panel? Well, uh, definitely Christian marriage is different from uh, non-Christian marriages. Uh, no question here or uh, doubt. Uh, I want to say just one thing. Uh, uh, I ask couples, do you believe in God when they come to me? And they say yes. When they say yes, I know there is a bigger chance for them to restore their marriage. Because that counts a lot. Because they fight for their marriage. They want to do something. They want to learn. They want to uh, apologize. They want to repent. So they want to do something. And for me, I put it the first thing in the, my presentation because, because I'm, I'm totally convinced that a, <coughs> sorry, a person who believes in a marriage will fight, will keep fighting for uh, her, 
for their union. And that counts a lot. When you are not a Christian, you might say, well, it, it doesn't matter. I can find somebody, somebody else. So this is the big difference I see in practice. And of course, that's not the single one. But for me, it matters a lot because I see that uh, believers uh, think there are not only two, there are three there. And uh, that's the thing which uh, joins them together. Uh, and they, they have the power, find the power to fight. That's uh, very important because I personally cannot work with a person who is not motivated and who doesn't want to do anything. These are the drives which I need. And Christians who know that they have a problem have a Christian motivation. And that counts a lot, very much for their uh, relationship. 